Hi, welcome to First Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Travis Norton, Senior Pastor here in Colorado Springs. So glad that you found us online. We pray that this time will really bless you and God will speak to you through this message and through the hymns. Today we're talking about how Jesus releases us from prejudice, prejudice against other people, and also small-mindedness when it comes to God and thinking about what God is able to do. And hope that you'll be touched by the message and, and invited to, to pray those big prayers. In the life of our congregation, we're gearing up for Easter. One of the things our congregation does is we, we supply 500 Easter baskets to those in El Paso County, and we're collecting items for those baskets, and those are due on April 8th. We'd love for you to be a part of that. I pray that you would join us in prayer as we prepare for this message. Father, we thank you for your love for us and for the way that you listen to our prayers, even those audacious ones. You know what's on our hearts and in our minds. I pray that you would hear those prayers and answer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gospel according to Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you. But only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. 
When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We live in a world that is defined by difference. Every day we go out into the world and we filter what we see by whether people are like us or whether they are unlike us. We watch the news and we see how these differences in our world erupt into conflict and crisis. Right now we're watching Russians fighting Ukrainians, just the most recent example of how this works. But we'll see it again this week as the Supreme Court Justice begins her hearing and the division between Republicans and Democrats erupts again. <laughs> Those differences in how people see the world, how people want to be governed, are the source of so much conflict in our world. And often that conflict devolves into hatred and sin. We live in a world defined by our differences, here in our own community too, I know there's contention in my kids' school district over leadership and vision for the future. School boards are now places where those differences become plain, one group arguing for more equity and diversity, another group fearing how that might affect their children. Rich and poor, Christian and unbeliever, employees and employers. How do you experience these differences in your life? Do they lead to conflict? Do they cause unwanted strife? Jesus enters into the city of Capernaum, and he encounters something strange. The city was the largest city on the Sea of Galilee. It was a trading post. It was populated by a diverse set of people. You would think it would be a city rife with friction and division and conflict. But there is a centurion there. A centurion was a Roman officer in charge of a hundred troops, occupying the city, ruling on behalf of Rome and the, the puppet king that Rome had installed. But instead of division, Jesus finds peace and goodwill in the city. The centurion's job would have been to enforce Roman rules, put down rebellion, make sure taxes were collected, you would think he would be despised by the people. But there was something different about this centurion. He isn't hated by those who are different than him. He has all sorts of power. He is an outsider. He's part of an occupying force. And they don't hate him because this centurion was not prejudiced, was not small-minded. He didn't think of himself as better than. Instead, he used his power and his resources not to benefit himself, but to benefit the people of the city in which he lived, even though they were very different than himself. Even though he wasn't Jewish, he built the Jews a synagogue. I was trying to think of an analogy in our world. It would be like a, an American Christian captain occupying a town in Afghanistan with a company of soldiers building a mosque for the Muslims there. The centurion knew something about leadership that not all leaders understand. It's not just about having authority, but using that authority to serve those around you. I mean, so many people rise up through the ranks in society, but when they gain the leader's seat, they use that power to protect themselves and those who are like them. Think of the, the oligarchs in Russia with their multi-million dollar yachts. They use their power and influence to keep out the difference, to solidify sameness, creating echo chambers. News from Russia suggests that the people around President Putin don't tell him anything that differs from what he wants to hear. And the whole country has passed laws now against sharing an opinion other than the official view of Moscow. And we all know leaders who do this, who use their power and authority to insulate themselves to the detriment of those who are different. 
Jesus walks into Capernaum, and he's greeted by Jewish elders pleading with Jesus on behalf of the Roman centurion to heal a slave of his who has fallen ill. Because the centurion was kind and generous to those different than himself, he created a culture, a small pocket of peace and goodwill, so that when the time came when he needed help, those who were different than him, those who were beneath him, wanted to help him. And this too shows remarkable humility that the centurion would reach out to someone like Jesus, this wandering rabbi from a different religion, from a different town, a nobody, much lower in rank than himself. The centurion reaches out for help. And the Jews say that he was a man of love, that he loved the Jewish people, and that he loved this slave who had fallen ill. As a side note, I know it's hard when we read the Bible and something like slavery appears, and we're not sure what to do with it. Slavery is abhorrent human behavior that should be condemned in every age, regardless of any historical context that might make it more palatable. And Jesus, in his ministry, would teach a, an upside-down theology that would turn the world on its head so that those who were on the lowest ranks, those who were the slaves and the servants, were lifted up and to be regarded as better than ourselves. The centurion was a man of his time, and he owned at least one slave. But when that slave became sick, the centurion humbled himself to find healing for someone who was clearly beneath him in the rules of that society. There are so many differences in this story between the people. Differences of religion between the Jewish elders and the, and the Gentile Roman Differences of classes between the centurion and the slave, of nationality between the, the nation of Israel and the nation of Rome. Differences of health status, those who are sick and those who are ill. Differences of those who have power and authority and those who don't. Yet in all of this, there seems to be this harmony, this peace that we usually don't find in a world of differences. And Jesus enters into this strange pocket and at the pleading of the Jewish elders, he starts making his way toward the home of the centurion. But Jesus never meets the centurion, never meets the slave. Before he makes it to the centurion's home, the centurion has already sent out friends of his to say, no need to come any further, Jesus. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. Simply say the word, and I trust that my slave will be made well. The centurion understands something about authority, commanding men in his company from place to place, and he believes Jesus has that same kind of authority, can simply command healing, and healing will take place. And at this, Jesus is amazed, amazed at the faith of this Roman centurion. He says something very interesting. Jesus says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus heals the slave without setting foot in the centurion's home, without seeing him or the slave. This is a story about prayer, about trusting Jesus, about trusting God that he can do whatever he wants from wherever he is. It's certainly a story about how Jesus releases us from prejudice against those who are different than us, releases us from small and narrow-mindedness about who God is and what God can do. When he sees the broad faith of the centurion, Jesus lifts him up as an example of how we should all view the world and view God. In Jesus, we can view the world not with fear and suspicion at those who are different than us, but with an open mind geared toward seeing the gifts that everyone has as they're made in the image of God. And we can see in God someone who is not small, but who is big, who has broad authority and power to accomplish anything that God wants to accomplish to answer even our most audacious prayers. When Jesus commends the centurion for his faith, 
he is challenging some powerful misconceptions. Not even in Israel, the people who were God's chosen people, the ones who had the temple and the priest, the home of all of the super religious Pharisees, the ones who had the scriptures and the stories of old and all the heroes that came with it. Jesus says, not even in Israel, with all of that, have I found such faith. And Jesus lifts up this outsider, this Roman, this centurion, this Gentile, as someone whose faith we should imitate. And I wonder if they were ready for this, ready to let go of their prejudice, their religious prejudice, and see that faith in Jesus, the great faith, can come from any kind of people in any corner. Are we ready for this? Ready to be released from our prejudice against people who are different than us, who believe differently than we do? Are we ready to be released from our small understanding of God that keeps God in a box? Released from that to see the God who can answer any prayer, no matter how big it is. What is it that the centurion understood that amazed Jesus so much? He recognized Jesus as something more than just an itinerant rabbi teaching and doing special things in that area. He saw in Jesus someone who was from above, someone who had great authority and power, someone who could dispel sickness with a word. Do we believe in Jesus like that? That he has that kind of power, that kind of authority? Do we believe that God is God, that God is free, that God can do anything, and that God is active in this world, in our lives? When I was in high school, I went on a, a beach trip, which is a strange thing to do in Utah. <laughs> we went to Bear Lake. Anybody ever been to Bear Lake, Utah? up in the mountains. We, we're, my church was in Salt Lake, and we piled onto this old yellow bus, and, and we made our way through the mountains, past Logan, and up into to Bear Lake. And when we got there, it was raining, pouring. And it looked like our beach day was over before it had begun. But someone suggested that we pray. And so all of us high school students in our shorts and tank tops with our towels and sunscreen, we prayed. And when we stopped praying, the rain stopped. And so we went out and had our beach day. And I was in high school at the time, and so we just thought that's how it worked. <laughs> right? You pray, God answers, you enjoy your day. But there were these two, um, two men with us uh, who were helping lead the trip who were not part of our church. They were actually Mormons. And they were not impressed by what had happened. And I remember just listen, overhearing them talk, and they kept looking at the skies saying, I, don't, I think it's going to rain again. I don't think we should go out. They, they stayed on the bus for a while while we all left. They begrudgingly got off the bus, and they were looking up the whole time, just waiting, because they had a hard time seeing prayers from people in a faith other than theirs being answered. They struggled with that. And looking back, I have to admit that I have skepticism now that I didn't have when I was in high school. I find myself wondering if we just got lucky. Was it just a coincidence? I mean, I know now mountain showers come on quickly and they go quickly. Maybe it was just a coincidence. We prayed at just the right time. We ended our prayer at just the right time. And just by happenstance, the rain had stopped. We didn't witness a miracle, just the natural order of nature. You know what I miss? The faith I had when I was in high school. The faith of a child. The faith that doesn't have that kind of skepticism. Because most of us adults, even if we're Christians, a lot of us are functional atheists. We don't really believe that God is big and powerful and works in the world today. Do you find yourself a little put off by God talk? 
People who say, God said this to me, God intervened on my behalf, God healed me. We've become skeptical of God's work in this world. We may say we trust Jesus for the next world, life after this one. But what about this world? Jesus can release us from our lack of faith. Jesus can show us the God who is God, who is at work who is powerful and here in our midst, the God who can free us from our prejudice, the God who can show us what a God really is. Are we open to that? To that kind of God who answers prayers, to the God who heals the sick, to a God who transforms lives and brings about change, change that this world needs, the God the centurion believed Jesus was, Because if we're open to that, it'll change the way we pray. How many of you watched the Ukrainian president as he addressed uh, members of Congress this past week? Some of you saw that. That was a lesson in prayer. He had nothing to lose. So he asked the most powerful nation in the world for everything. Give me jets. Give me a no-fly zone. Intervene on my behalf. He knew we had the ability. And so he asked, without fear or intimidation, he asked for everything. I challenge us to pray to God like Zelensky prayed to America. To pray to God the way the centurion prayed to Jesus. Pray the big prayers that only God can answer that only the God who has all the authority and the power can answer, but know this, that that same God, with all his power, also loves you with all his heart. So pray for the healing of your loved ones. Pray for peace in this world. Pray for an end to prejudice in all its forms. Pray for our church that we might be used by God to bring people to faith in Jesus, especially young people who in this day and age are having such a hard time believing in this God. Pray for rain to end the droughts. Pray for the hungry to be fed. Pray for the poor to be lifted up. Pray the big prayers today and see what God does. Amen? Amen. Amen. We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that. May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord.